FTP words two eminent faculty are with us today dr sucharita das and dr ranjan waji i request dr um, sucharita to take over and conduct the uh, session before that i request all the participants excepting the speaker and the moderator to keep the mics muted please all the participants participants must keep the mics muted and uh, you can put your questions in the chat box or after the talk is over you can unmute your yourself and uh, pose the question directly to the speaker and the faculty available and uh, thank you so much and have a good time thank you so much dr sucharita please uh, start this session thank you sir um, uh, dr niranjan uh, we welcome you to this session today's topic is uh, aot regurgitation echocardiography to the of aortic regurgitation um, actually aortic valve is an assessment of the aortic valve is an important aspect uh, when we think about the uh, perioperative uh, in surgical patients, because the proximity of the aortic valve and the ischemic aorta to the esophagus make, gives it a very high resolution and to look onto the structures becomes very easy. So um, today's topic is very important. We come across in the uh, operation theater very frequently about the air with the mix of MS, MR, all those things. So uh, Dr. Niranjan is going to talk about our aortic regurgitation echocardiography. Dr. Niranjan is working as a uh, director of the Max Narabati Hospital. Uh, uh, his uh, special interest is in the lungs ultrasound, uh, echocardiography, perioperative, a heart and lung transplant. He's working as a director of anesthesia cardiothoracic transplant. He has got a fellowship in American Society of Echocardiography. He has done diploma at Advanced T National Board of uh, Echocardiography USA. Uh, Dr. Niranjan, we welcome you here. Please start the session for today. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sucharita, for the introduction, kind introduction. Thank you, sir. For the opportunity, it's always a pleasure and honor to be here for any academic event. So, without that, we just uh, let's proceed with the topic today. I'll share my screen. Uh, am I audible? Everything's uh, clean. Can you see the screen? Yeah, yeah, you're audible, and I can see your screen. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So the topic for today is aortic regurgitation, echo for echo, aortic regurgitation. I have no disclosures to make. So when, when it comes to aortic regurgitation, uh, what, what do you want to know? When you say it's an, there's an AR, what are the questions that come to mind? Just quantifying AR, is it mild or severe? Does it make any sense or you need to know uh, anything more or come to a better conclusion? So the questions can, is it significant? Yeah, yeah. Significant do it. We need it doesn't need a medical management, surgical, or just follow up. Then the if the, if the surgical indications, if it, if there are indications, what kind of surgery? If the surgery only of the aortic valve or aorta, the root or what else? If there's concomitant surgery is going on like a CBG or other valve, a mitral valve or aortic case, uh, you will find an AR. So do we need to address it? These are all the questions that come to uh, to an echocardiographer, a cardiac echocardiographer's mind or to them, or to them perioperative. If there's IV, well, bad. If there's AR or no, presence of AR is most important. So you will be asked questions whether, whether the AR is mild, does it need to be corrected, or can it go with higher with the bad. Uh, aortopathy, bicuspid periodic valve, etc. All can uh, pose questions to, uh, to 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 us while doing echocardiography. So there are guidelines, yeah, and hopefully by the end of this uh, this uh, talk we can answer these questions. So as you all know, the aortic aortic root has, uh, is there as uh, in the diagram as well. There's aortic uh, there's aortic cannulus uh, which is measured from the base uh, of each leaflet attachment. Then there is the these are the sinus of valve. The, this is the ST junction where a juncture of the sinus uh, sinus is to the ascending aorta is the ST junction and then the ascending aorta. These are all the measurements that we need to make. You can see the valves are semilunar valves. They are, they are the two valves will have the two coronaries coming and recast. Yeah, the, the attachment of each of the casts here are the cup measures. Raffi, for example, has to, will be 
but it will be at a below the level of austere. I mean, these are semilunar valves, and at the at the, at the tip of the center of each uh, each free cusp is a thickening. That kind of normal finding that that we nodes of RN5. And if you uh, if you see the if the raffae if at all they arise in the spiral valve, they will not go all the way uh, till the free cusp. They'll just uh, stop much beside that. So these are the if you if you go by recommendations as per echo guidelines, um, you are to go all the measurements uh, for the aorta and uh, setting a uh, sinus uh, sinus of so what do you mean by sinus of salvo uh, 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 All these measurements actually had to be from leading edge to leading edge as a class one indication uh, to avoid blooming artifact to avoid the blooming. From leading edge to leading edge, or from deep from behind. Uh, however, uh, if if the measurements are difficult to do by leading edge, uh, uh, and the aortic cusps are completely open, when the aortic valve just starts opening, it's just the beginning of this. Uh, uh, systole. When the aortic valve just begin to close that end towards the end of systole, when the two leaflets are completely open parallel to the to the ascending aorta uh, uh, walls, that's the time mid systole, and that's the time where your uh, annulus has to be measured. There's a role of CTMR in case of any discordance, which we will uh, see subsequently. So the if you see the next slide here, these are just the guidelines as per the Valvular Heart Association in uh, 2020. Dr. Niranjan, sir, sorry yes. to interrupt. Yes, sir. There is a request for you to go slow. Okay. Can you be a bit slow so that? Well, um, surely. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yes, yes. So these are the guidelines as per the valve uh, 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 heart guidelines as per AHF. Uh, this, this is a flow chart which shows, just shows we can call how to quantify AR. AR can be at the milder side, the green, or severe side. So th these things are easier to easier to get. But what, what is important is the yellow thing. If there's between mild to moderate, grade two and three, these are the questions that come, come, uh, come up to our uh, discretion and whether we have to then be, comes, to, comes, us, comes up to us, whether we need, uh, it's on the milder side or severe side and what we need to do about it. So that's where quantification of AR will be important. And we see in subsequent slides, how do we try to get there and get to a conclusion is mild or severe. Finally, if there's a discordance between the symptoms of the patient or the values what we're getting or the echo or the echo findings what we're getting, then you can always uh, resort to CT or MR, uh, uh, cardiac MR for the quantification. The most of the parameters can be obtained by transthoracic echo. It's in the aortic valve in the front, uh, front of the chest. Uh, transthoracic echo is right there. However, the resolution of T is much higher and any specific cases like measurements, uh, dissection, infective endocarditis, and other things, perioper and perioperative scenario, T is of paramount importance. So now the role of echocardiography with pertaining to T. What do we want to know? What are we supposed, what are we trying to look at? It? So what uh, diagnosis? First of all, you look just look at the aortic valve. We want to pick up the valve, this bicuspid valve, tricuspid valve, whether the leaflets contract are uh, moving where thick and calcified. Secondly, you want to come to the where there's acute AR. Chronic AR. Chronic AR is important where because it is just stage two, we have to classify that into stage C or D. D is obviously symptomatic, but in stage C, we have to put, that, put it whether it's stage C1 or C2. And why is it important? We'll come to know subsequently. Etiology surgery. Etiology, you want to get a fair idea on the etiology of the valve, uh, what's happening, why is the AR happening. AR is never physiological. If you have an AR, it's always going to be pathological. It can be because of the leaflets or it can be because of the root. But we need to, if you see a more than mild AR, we need to go and see, interrogate or investigate what's happening. In the uh, row echo can be like as the etiology, uh, whether it's diodic dissection, if you look at it, it's rheumatic leaflet. You can get an idea of the mechanism of AR, quantification of AR, that uh, what we'll see later on. So the headings under which we are going to go, the talk will go on. And that, uh, at the end of the day, we should be able to tell what is the timing of surgery. What, what kind of surgery will we need to do? Uh, aortic valve replacement, is the repair possible? Or a resuspension of the same valve in aortic dissection? Once you put a replacement, how do you assess the valve? Uh, do a repair, what is the adequate repair? Uh, is there any uh, uh, question of an iatrogenic post uh, 
uh, non aortic valve surgery leading to a new onset here. So these are the things what we want to see on echo. Comrades, views what we want to do. This is if you want to first view on the left is the uh, mid esophageal aortic short axis view. So we go to how do you get the view? Go to 30, uh, uh, mid esophageal view. 30, uh, keep the uh, uh, multiple angle with 30, 40 degree and just slightly, slight little anti deflection and pull it up till you get the three cups. So mostly it's bent sign as you classically see, as you classically see. What we'll come to know from each view will subsequently uh, look at the subsequent slides. This is the mid is a long axis view. How do we get that? Go to mid uh, mid is a four chamber view. Turn the multiplanar angle to 120, 130, 140 degrees. Slight rotation to the right as the aorta comes from the right hand side, orientate to the right side, and you open up this view in the aorta and long axis. Here, what do we see here? You see here the aortic valve. This is the right coronary cast, which is the most anteriorly, and the posteriorly could be the non-coronary non cast or the left coronary cast, which we would not be able to comment. Depending, on, we can find out only if we rotate uh, uh, the, uh, the probe clockwise or counterclockwise. And you can see that if you pull out this view, the most important view, if you pull the probe, uh, the, uh, probe a little bit out, you will, you will expose more of the aorta, and, uh, uh, and then subsequently, you can take the measurements. This view is uh, important to see whether this is prolapse, femoral leaflet, it's a jet area, jet width, etc. What we see is a few slides. The third, uh, the third view here is a deep transvastic view, where you go deep into the stomach uh, totally, and then anti-flex the probe, and then pull it out to the resistance. And this, this you get this view at zero degree. And that, this is one of the views which is important because the flow here is most parallel to the alignment of the continuous flow of pulsar Doppler. So for any measurements of Doppler measurements, you want to see the gradients, you want to pressure half time, so the uh, you want to measure the regurgitant jet or the, or the velocity gradients across the aortic valve. Uh, this is the, uh, or find a cardiac output or a calculation of ER, uh, uh, of the AR, these are calculations, quantify AR, this is a view to get because of the alignment of the flow. Another view where which can be transgastic long axis view where you go in the stomach and rotate to 40, uh, to, to like uh, 7, 8, 80, 90, 100 degrees and rotate to the right to open the, for getting the alignment in the aorta. So now coming to the echo view, how do they look? So first view on the left, uh, left down is the classical mid uh, aortic short axis view. Uh, as you can see here, as you can see here, you have a series band sign, you can put a color Doppler here, and even when the leaflets are closed here, there is a regurgitation jet here, right here, the aliasing that is caused. On the top is a, a same view, you can see a flap here, aortic dissection, and if you see go down, there's thickening calcification of the right coronary cast. So when you, when you see this cast, the three casts here, in the T, this is the most anterior most structure. So this is the right coronary cusp. This is the left of the patient. This is the left coronary cusp from the left, where the left coronary, coronary artery will arise. And this is the NCC or the non-coronary cusp because it is uh, from where the no coronary artery will take place. And it is how do you identify that? Because it's just close to the septum here. This is, again, what we're going to do. Now coming to the long axis view. So mid esophageal long axis view, we know, we have seen how we get it. And what are information can you get on the echo here? So this is the most important view here. First figure on the top to take the measurements. As you say, I, as I told you, I measure measure uh, the leaflets are open and is Mr. Stoll, inner edge to inner edge for the annuals and rest are from leading edge to leading edge. This will be sinus of soil salva, ST junction, ascending aorta, and arch can be measured. At all times, you want to the distance has to be perpendicular to the uh, to, to the direction of blood flow and to the direction of the aortic valves. It should not be obliquely cut. If it's obliquely cut, there's uh, uh, there's chances of error. And uh, if you are measuring a cardiac output, uh, say an area like pi r square, where the radius or the measurement gets squared, then your error gets exponential. So it's very essential to measure them accurately. In the one below this measurement, the next the figure below on the left hand side, we are measuring the elevated diameter. So just place the uh, uh, cursor just beneath the aortic valve and in the LVOT. So these are the aortic valve. Just beneath that is from here in the to in the edge, we see the elevated diameter. So this is important to help us in calculating cardiac output and the area and areas and quantifications. 
uh, the next jet here, you can see there is a colorful Doppler applied. First two, uh, first two are 2D images. Next is the color, colorful, color Doppler applied. And you can see the narrowest jet. This is the AR jet. You can see uh, just eyeballing. This is not a big jet. It appears to be a tiny jet. You can measure the Vena contractor. The Vena contractor is the narrowest diameter of the regurgitated jet. So this jet will flow, regurgitated flow will flow from the aorta here, back here. And you measure the diameter here is 0.3 mild vena contractor. This is the M mode. You can just put an M mode across here and get an M mode image. Details will be, I'll speak to you later by calculating the ratio of the jet width to LVOT width. The, the, but this is the utility of this view. Secondly, if you can see here, uh, this video up here, you can see the RCC and just focus on the LCC or NCC here. You can see it prolapsing here. So this is one of the uh, things you can be possibly repaired or something to repair. And one below, the top right below, if you see, you see a jet. It appears to be a more uh, significant AR, isn't it? Uh, probably at least by eyeballing, because it's going all the way to the LVOT. So, but is this the right method, method to quantify this? May not be. So jet, a jet going all the way into LVO, uh, into the to the tip of mitral leaflet might be an indicator that it is a significant AR, but it is not a specific criteria to quantify it. Because the jet length or jet depth will depend upon the gradient between the aorta and the LV EDP, LV and diastolic pressures of equalization. So even in tiny jets where the gradient is high, the length of the jet can be high. Deep transgastic view, go to stomach, antiflex, pull it out and try to get it best aligned. These are the things what you get. Uh, this is a put a culture. Uh, yeah, you if you're get the best view, best alignment, best measurements, what you need to do is get the view. Get the best possible alignment here. Put the color Doppler. And then the, the center of the pulse wave or the color, color Doppler, what you put, has to be the center of the uh, color, color Doppler uh, waveform, what you're getting, or the color, uh, color Doppler uh, pattern, what you're getting. This is important so that you get the, you give yourself the best possible chance to get the, uh, the, uh, the outcome of the pulse wave Doppler or continuous wave Doppler. So now here you put the continuous wave Doppler, you get a best envelope here, best possible envelope. If you do not do this appropriately, you, are, you may not cut it in the center of the regurgitant jet. This is more so if the jet is uh, eccentric jet. So you are, uh, and then you will not take a right measurement or you may not come to a right conclusion. So you the you can do a Doppler, continuous wave Doppler has to be in the proper center of the regurgitant jet. Okay. So here you measure the pressure half time. Here you're measuring you. This is the on top is the continuous wave Doppler. You can see the two lines here. You just place beneath the below the aortic valve. So this is the LA mitral valve, LV, and aortic valve. Beneath the, and, uh, the Doppler is placed just beneath the aortic valve to get the LVOT VDI. This is for calculation of gradients as a cardiac output. Here you have uh, you have placed the continuous wave Doppler across the uh, aortic valve. You see the aortic valve gradients post repair or maybe post or replacement or just uh, before pre-op surgery. In this, uh, in, in, you can see in this uh, uh, deep transgastic view, this is a, uh, this is a deep transgastic uh, long axis view, which I was talking about. You can see the planar angle at 1, 1, 130, 140 degrees. Here, and you can, the alignment is uh, appropriate, is, is uh, appropriate, will be excellent here, in this kind of view. What I want you to focus on this is, uh, if, you, if you see on these leaflets here, they're not co-opting. So you can, in this view also, you can, uh, this view, you also can be used to see the uh, interrogate, the regurgitant jet, the direction, the leaflets that are co-opting or not. Only uh, the flaw or drawback of this view is the aorta is further away from the near, it's in a far field. So this is a pro, our T probe is here. Waves are going away. So uh, the aorta well, is further away than the long axis view from here. So there could be a little uh, in inaccuracies or the quality of images might be a little hampered here. But as long as you get a good image quality and you optimize your image, uh, this view can be, uh, this, this is also an excellent view to uh, investigate a band. You can see the view below, there's a very uh, uh, mosaic or aliasing cause, uh, aliasing that is happening uh, in this view. If you see again, I play the video again, the last bottom right thing, you can see there is a, a break of color. This is called aliasing or music pattern. And that's that's called a pizza formation or it's called a flow convergence. This is happening during AS and AR both. Uh, we'll, we'll discuss about this in subsequent slides.
Okay, one of the other things that we need to uh, differentiate is the acute versus chronic AR. So acute AR, what are the causes that cause acute AR? Sudden onset, big massive AR, aortic dissection, sudden onset, trauma to the chest, infective endocarditis. Uh, you are literally just gives way and just flails, and you get an uh, acute AR. So what are the features of an acute AR? Can you pick up whether the AR is acute or chronic depending on say, looking at the echo? Yes. So LV is not dilated in acute AR. The ejection fraction will be slightly reduced. The jet won't appear, the jet will be small, the jet won't appear that big. Why? Because there's equally equalization of chambers rapidly and you won't get a very uh, dense jet and the same. Early closure of mitral valve, another indication of uh, 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 early mitral indication that uh, that is very severe AR. It is a severe AR, probably a acute onset. So uh, this, this you get only in acute onset AR. Uh, whether you go R wave corresponds to the, to the onset of diastole. So that, that we can time that it's easy, or we can uh, time this with the closure of mitral or aortic glass to see whether in which stage of the cardiac cycle are we for timing this accordingly. Chronic AR, on the other side, if you see if the AR is built up over a long time, so LV is, gets remodeled, it is dilated. See if you see the image below, you see the LV here, is L dilated, globular LV. The LVDP is not too high. There will be good gradient. Will be will be this best. Uh, the jet will be very well visible in all the views here. Ejection fraction may not fall immediately. For it will be a late for finding. So, uh, whatever discussion we have eventually is going to be about chronic AR and whether we need to operate or not operate is the question. And how can these findings see? just because of the severe AR and uh, there's a appears to be significant AR and LV is dilated. Do we need to really go for surgery straight away or no? We'll, we'll come to that. Mechanism of AR. Now, this is a standard table, Elkavi's classification, which uh, tells us uh, is also adapted from the, the mechanism of, uh, of regurgitation for the mitral valve. It can be divided into three types type 1, type 2, type 3. Type 1 is primarily a central jet, whether where there's no leaflet morphology per se, uh, is not a, uh, there's no excessive or restrictive motion of the leaflets. The leaflets are going to be moving normally, but if it is divided into, uh, into four categories. Most likely in type 1, you should get a central jet. Leaflets are uh, supposed to be more or less uh, normal, except in stage where it's perforated, but the movement or the, uh, the excessive or restrictive is not there. So in, in uh, type A, there is a ST junction and ascending your dilatation. In type 2, there is a sinus of Valsalva and ST junction dilatation. In C, there's a more of a root dilatation. All these dilation of root and ascending out and actually things, the, uh, the, the stretch on leaflet is cause, causing, it prevents the coaptation, appropriate coaptation of the leaflets, which should be at least four to five millimeters. And that is causing the central jet. Uh, in type D is a rare exceptional case where there's a perforation, infective endocardial perforation, and that can cause a, you yeah, co-opting well. Like you can see here, they're all these A, B, C, they're not co-opting. Here, D, they're co-opting, but there's a perforation that can cause a uh, jet. It could be more or less central, not exactly centric. That is, uh, uh, that is uh, because of infective endocardial type 1. Type 2 is because of excessive valve motion. So like a flail leaflet or prolapsed leaflet. So if you can see in this image here, uh, this image here, this is a prolapsing leaflet on the top, uh, bottom right hand side. This is a prolapsing leaflet. If you leaflet uh, flail or prolapse, uh, the rigor jet is always in the opposite direction. If it's a restricted leaflet, it's always in the same direction. So if you see in the in type 2, excessive motion, flail leaflet, the uh, eccentric jet is directed away from the flail leaflet. Also, what we measure here, you can see the tip of the leaflet here, which is, uh, which is prolapsing. It's not flail, it's not pointing towards the LVOT, but it is prolapsing. And this, uh, this leaflet is almost close to the aortic annulus. So this effective height is almost close to zero. If it goes below, the effective height becomes negative. If it uh, ideal effective height is nine millimeters, we come to know uh, come to in the subsequent slides to how how the different measurements can guide us for the aortic valve repair. So these are the things uh, we we want to know whether we can repair this valve or not to repair this valve, etc. And third is a type three is the uh, restrictive motion for so restrictive leaflets. Uh, then three can be three A three P uh, primarily restrictive in a pneumatic case. Thick calcified leaflet they're not moving. There'll be one of the more, more leaflets will one or both the leaflets may not move. So both leaflets not move. We can get more or less uh, uh, centralized jet. If, if only one leaflet is restricted, then we are the that the rigor jet will be towards uh, towards the pathological leaflet. So in flame. 
the rigor jet is away from the pathological leaflet. If the leaflet is restricted, the jet will more or less be towards the same pathological or restricted leaflet. Apart from these measurements, you want to see the evaluate the on the top. You want to see is a root and ascending avatar and annulus. The annulus got to be less than twenty five. Anything ascending or the avatar or the root more than forty, you definitely have to have the patient has to have a close follow up with CL echoes. The patient does not have to be necessarily undergo surgery right away. The as per guidelines, you see subsequently when which are the cases that need to be operated for the bentals or for the root or for the ascending avatar. So, actually, more than 40 any measurements we have to closely follow, follow with the echo, except in exceptional cases. Uh, coming to the causes or etiology of AR, uh, coming uh, very different causes. Acute AR can be because of, like I said, trauma, aortic dissection, uh, infective endocarditis, flail, and uh, Barlow disease. Uh, any can, connective tissue disorder can cause more of a mixed matters, uh, uh, can more of type 2 flail mechanisms, and ER will be away from the pathological leaflet directed away. And uh, rheumatic, calcivatic, calcivatic, degenerative uh, lesions. Can have the type three, uh, uh, type three mechanism of AR. So these are the echo images. What show uh, type one on the left, middle type two, and right on type three. Uh, what we see, you can see on the uh, one on top, uh, type one is central leaflet are uh, coapted center. The jet is more or less central. In type two, you will see the jet is eccentric and going away from this uh, leaflet. This is a flea leaflet in the 2D echo. You can see there's a little, little the tip of the leaflet is coming below the uh, aortic annulus, close to the aortic annulus, which should be right here actually, with a coefficient and uh, height of four to five millimeters. So you get eccentric there. Now the type three, it both uh, this leaflet appears to be a little shriveled. Actually, both the RCC it appears to be fine, but LCC or NCC you can probably comment it's a little shriveled kind of thing. So we can get a little mild, mildly eccentric jet towards towards the uh, towards the MCC or LCC part. Uh, now we have to categorize, quantifying the ER, uh, quantify the AR, mild, moderate, severe. There are several parameters that you can see on the left hand side. Uh, aortic leaflets, LV size, uh, the jet, jet width, slow conversions, jet, jet jet density, jet acceleration. So all these are there are several things. They can be divided into three things. Uh, there are some qualitative parameters, this eyeballing, put the color, and you know, get an idea of this mild or severe AR. You cannot really quantify them. You can infer idea, it might be towards mild AR or severe AR. Then there are quantitative, uh, uh, semi quantitative parameters, and then there are quantitative parameters. The quantitative parameters are the rigorous volume, rigorous fraction, and the EROA, effective rigorous blood orifice area. Now, these calculations are complex calculations. They are not routinely done, they are time consuming. But yes, when uh, in the OR, if you are in, in between like the stage two and stage three, uh, so now we have to classify whether it's severe or mild and come to a conclusion. Then we can definitely, we need to know about them. We need to go and apply those quantitative measures, advanced quantitative measures to come to a conclusion. And we are going to see this in the subsequent slide. As I said, the three types of assessment. Now, first of all, when you come uh, just I, a 2D echo, the valence, whether it is tricuspid or bicuspid valve. Then you are getting a clue about other vegetations, any perforations, infective endocarditis, any flap, dissection flap, other thick and mixed matter leaflets. Then we have, we have already seen put in long axis view and get a mechanism. Is the leaflet prolapsing or is it moving well? Exclusive leaflet type 2 or is the uh, leaflet type 3? Type uh, or, or the leaflets are moving well, but this annulus is dilated type 1. So depending on that, type 1 and type 2 are more or less, uh, uh, more or less they can be repaired. And type 3 are Rarely they can be afforded repair, but we'll discuss on this in detail a little later. You can measure the calculus, uh, calculated distances and uh, measurements that you take in the annular size, sinus of Alsalva, SC junction, ascending order, and arch. In this view, you also measure the LV diameters. You, uh, you can measure the LV the, uh, volumes, LV and diastolic and systolic volumes. You can calculate the N, LV and diastolic and N systolic diameters. You can calculate the ejection fractures. All these numbers are important, and we'll put, we'll put all of them together at the end of the discussion. Uh, regarding a type of valve, suppose we, are, we have want to put in a, a, a surgically put a valve which is a sutilis valve or a possible valve. There are specific measurements that we need to take here in this view in 2D echo. So we get the annual size and ST junction size. The ratio has to be less than 1.3. Only then can you uh, put the possible valve or the sutilis valve. 
So these are several things that come to mind. You can see the longest area or the dissection flap here. You can see the dissection flap. So this come to the state of your etiology. Again, in the case of aortic dissection, you have to evaluate the leaflets. These look pretty all right. Probably they may not need an aortic uh, bell replacement. This should be okay with only a David's, David's procedure where you replace the setting aorta uh, and the root, but not, may not be the uh, may not be the valve. This will again depend on what measures we take and how we get by calculate. Okay, now coming to the qualitative parameters. What are they? Qualitative para parameters is primarily, we'll come to know, jet width, flow convergence, jet density, uh, the pressure half time, the distillation rate on continuous Doppler at a diastolic flow reversal in the sending aorta. Just a qualitative, have a look and get an idea with this minus C area. Jet width, made a, made a search and long distance view, where I get a good view, color, put a color Doppler and you see the jet width in the LVOT. Here, the important thing is that what the jet width has to be seen closer to or interrogator investigated that area closer to the aortic valve. You cannot within one centimeter. You cannot go below that. Below that, there's blood entrapment, splitting of the jet, and you'll get false results. So it just close immediately below the valve. The jet is occupying most of the LVOT, uh, uh, LVOT diameter, LVOT area. Probably you can say there's a little significant here. Uh, if it occurred very tiny jet, we may not, uh, we may say it is maybe a little uh, uh, minor or uh, trivial or my, mild ER. But it, this again has to be there with different ways. This is just eyeballing, you're not quantifying that. And this is applicable only for sample jets. Secondly, flow conversions. Now, again, if you put a mirror, it's a long axis view or deep transgastric, long, uh, deep transgastric view, which I said. Wherever you get a best alignment, uh, you got to give a good, good, good alignment, put a color Doppler. And uh, you have to adjust in a uh, color of you have to adjust the velocity. Velocity or the is, is the LAZ velocity. That depends on your NQ is an IQ limit. You can see the numbers here 69, this thing. So in your aortic valve around 60, 70 is a standard IQ limit. You can see that. And you can see the, you can see aortic regurgitant jet, for example. Now this is the LA, LV, this is the aortic valve, and right side is the aorta. So the rigor, aortic regurgitant occur from right to the left from the aorta to the L into the LV and the flow in the entire regurgent orifice is here shown by the yellow arrow so as the regurgent jet approaches the orifice the velocity of each of the uh, particles in the regurgent jet will get accelerated and they cause aliasing aliasing color break and that's called flow acceleration it'll form an envelope here on the aortic side which is more or less hemispherical shape that is called a PISA or flow convergence. Now, uh, now this convergence will depend on your Nyquist as well. So if you get a bigger uh, flow convergence here, bigger size, probably the we might say it's the most significant AR. Uh, if it's smaller, tiny, maybe you may say it's a my, uh, uh, mild, uh, milder kind of AR. This will depend on your Nyquist limit also. So if it's a Nyquist limit is 40, then this, uh, even a tiny one will appear big. Similarly, at 70, if you're getting a big uh, big flow convergence, then more or less your AR is going to be significant. So this is one of the rapid qualitative assessments. Just have a look, eyeball it, put it up and get it. Disadvantage, it cannot be applied in multiple jets. Uh, it, it has to be more applicable only in central jets. Eccentric jets or wall looking jets for the quantum effect. Uh, and we probably can ca cause some errors. And the timing has to be in early diastole. Recurgent jet density. Now you get deep transgastic view, as I said, put a, uh, put a color, do uh, best alignment, put color Doppler, uh, the, uh, try to put a continuous view Doppler cuts right in the middle of the color Doppler and uh, uh, flow what you're getting. And then uh, get the color wave, uh, continuous view Doppler measurements and you get this, uh, what you got out. In the density of envelope, if you see at the top, the, it's not to, you can make out a difference between the one below the baseline and above the baseline. Above the baseline is the AR jet. Anything that moves towards the probe will be above the baseline. Yeah. You are getting the AR jet and as faint. You know, see below the density is much more. Obviously, the below the, the slope is steeper, is a severe more significant severe AR. And if you can see that on the top, the slope is a little flat around. So that also might give an indication that not, may not be a significant AR. So however, you have to you should not look only at one point, one thing, one parameter. You have to look at the as a, as a constellation of parameters, as a combination of parameters to come to the conclusion where is minus C area. So the density of the envelope, less on the top, little milder area, dense below, more more towards significant area. The slope, 
it looks flatter on the top maybe a less significant ar below most more steeper possibly a significant ar but for this you are, you have to have center jet if there is regurgitant jet and your pod cannot get in order alignment proper alignment then you may not be able to land this also if you want to see whether uh, i'll come to and uh, i'll say this is the peak regurgitant velocity v max and then the, the it, it decays down this velocity has to be more than 4 4.5 when you check the scale here it has to be more 4 4.5 that just give an indication that you are properly measuring it if you get the uh, cut the cut your continuous with doppler obliquely obliquely jet you may not get a get an accurate reading so that is one of the indicators to keep in mind jet deceleration slope that is same thing we get a jet for a deep front gas group cut doppler continuous with doppler get applied in the center of the beam and get this pattern you can see this flatter this is more steeper pressure half time we just put a uh, curve uh, from this end to this end so 0.1 to 0.2 and you the machine calculates the pressure half time the calculate slope of this and the pressure half time so more flatter the less is the slope the less is a, is the slope velocity uh, less is the pressure half time the time time taken for the gradients between the aorta and the lvd v2 half that is indicative of aortic regurgitation uh, so if you can quantify it uh, pressure half time more than 5 long it takes to uh, for pressure to drop down is a milder area so you may even severe area this pressure half time will rapidly drop and less it will less than 200 millisecond similarly the slope slope is normal slope is 2 to uh, anything more than 2 to 3 meters per second slope is a significant air so steeper the slope slope is 3 or 2 to 3 is a significant air so uh, these are the measurements you can get also if you can see here at each time the peak velocity here the first point is the peak air peak v max part or peak uh, regurgitated velocity of the air jet and that has to be more than 4.5 coming to the uh, descending aorta interrogation send uh, so basically the normal aorta is a compliant vessel central vessel it should have biphasic pattern but there uh, even in physiological terms if there is stiff aorta there can be little uh, little little flow uh, below uh, uh, below the baseline so any uh, any flow towards this thing uh, any uh, if you have stiff aorta normally the aorta is compliant it should have biphasic flow what do you mean by biphasic flow suppose this is a baseline uh, this is a cursor the flow occurs towards the, towards the cursor anything towards the cursor is above the baseline so you get this systolic flow the biphasic flow will again plateau and be above the baseline even a stiffer aorta Uh, say in, in elderly patients, uh, they less compliant. So you you will have here systolic flow, but initially it might uh, be because stiffness of the aorta. Little uh, early diastolic regurgitation can be possible, and that can be normal. Uh, will be non-compliant. So uh, and this will be seen closer to the heart, closer to the aortic valve. But if you see the same thing as you as you go away from the aortic valve say descending aorta or abnormal aorta then that is really it does not physiology that's going to be pathology and you need to look at it so in uh, te mid esophageal view turn the probe at uh, zero degree turn totally to the left uh, you catch the aorta in a short axis view turn uh, um, turn the uh, angle at an angle to 90 degree catch the aorta in long axis view uh, put the cursor and uh, you can see the cursor on the right side of screen here this is the cephalic end The left side of the screen is the caudal end. The blood will flow flow from the cephalic end to the caudal end. So the cursor is pointed here. The flow will be towards the cursor. So the systolic flow will be towards the cursor, and we see now above the baseline, the regurgitant flow, which will flow back because of the AR, will be seen away from the cursor. So it will be below the baseline. So this is important because if you place the cursor on this end, you see the reverse pattern. So now, what do you want? What is? What do you want to look at? You want to look at the Pattern below the below the baseline. This is the diastolic flow. This happens. This are systolic flows. If the and this is the diastolic flow between the systolic flow and below the baseline. So the diastolic flow between the systolic flow is below the baseline. That means there is a diastolic flow reversal. If it lasts throughout the diastole, that is significant or indicative of significant AR. Now in the descending aorta, if this flow velocity is more than twenty year, this is definitely a significant AR. The same pattern. Now, uh, if anything that gets trans translocated as distally to the heart, you can see here on top that the diastolic flow velocity is the throughout the diastole and more than velocity is more than two really significant AR. If you see below, if your diastolic flow reversal is there, it doesn't last completely. See, this is the stone. Focus on the image below. 
systolic flow, systolic flow between the diastole. The diastolic flow reverses is there, but does not last throughout the diastole? Also, the velocity is much less. So probably can give you an indication that might be a less significant area. However, now these things, if they are reflected, in this, we are looking at in the descending aorta with the T. If they are double aorta, we see the trans thoracic uh, uh, same pattern. The one which is milder here. So uh, if those reversals get reflected in abdominal aorta, then it definitely indicative of a significant AR. So further away from the aortic valve, when you get descending flow reversals, that's going to be indicative of a significant AR. What we are focused in the T, we are seeing a descending thoracic aorta on the middle surgical view. So this is what we have uh, here. Now coming to the semi-quantitative methods. These are all qualitative. We have fair got an idea in mind or area. Now semi-quantitative methods. What are they? Vena contracta. Ratio of the jet width to the LVOT width and the jet area to LVOT area. For both of this uh, jet area and jet width, you have to have central jets. Okay, so we'll go to the next thing. Vena contracta. Now, what is my definition of Vena contracta? We get a mid surgical long axis view, put color Doppler, optimize Nyquist limit, and you get a regular jet. So, tiniest diameter. You get a, a level of the aortic cusp, you'll have a tiniest a regurgent orifice kind of stuff. And from there, that orifice or that area will have a tiny, tiniest jet. Tiniest jet of the regurgent or regurgent jet. Tiniest is, is the vena contractor. The vena contractor can be a kind of diameter of the EROA, effective regurgent orifice area. If it is a circle, this, that EROA, regurgent orifice, is not necessarily a circle. So you can't assume it's going to be a diameter, but it's roughly at that level. So basically, by definition, in a contract, the narrowest depth, narrowest diameter of the regurgitant jet is the Vena contract. What are the measurements? Less than 3, three to 6, and more than 6. Less than 3 is mild, more than 6 is significant. If it comes between that, that is time we need other parameters to confirm that. Probax, multiple advantages, yes. Eccentric jets, you can uh, apply Vena contract. But you got to be sure that what the calipers, when you're applying to measure the diameter, you got to be exactly perpendicular to the flow of the regurgitant jet. As you can see here, the jet is eccentric. We'll have to apply the uh, Vena contractor diameters here 0.32 milder area. Uh, on the top right corner, you can see multiple jets. So, one of the drawbacks of the Vena contractor, if there are multiple jets, uh, bicuspid valves, uh, probably this uh, may not be the best uh, parameter to. Uh, to, to check upon. Actually, we have a contractor, more accuracy. So, even in multiple jets, it can be useful, but it can overestimate or underestimate the Vena contractor in, uh, in, uh, in dynamic jets. Jet width. Now, the other thing, jet width to LVOT uh, diameter. Now, mid surface long is you put color Doppler, get a regurgitant uh, jet. Uh, you have got, you have told you before that the what interrogation has to be closer uh, within a centimeter of the aortic valve. Uh, aortic valve, aortic analysis. Otherwise, you'll get in a, an accurate results. So you find a jet width, LVT width, and a ratio. Anything less than 20, 20, 25 percent milder, more than 65 percent significant, uh, severe. Anything between, again, just don't go by value. We'll, uh, we'll have to, uh, we'll have to, uh, we'll have to uh, look at other parameters also to come to uh, conclusion. Another way of doing it is the uh, same view put the uh, M mode Doppler. The M mode has to be exactly perpendicular to the flow. Uh, to the flow occurring across the LVOT of the regurgitant jet. Yeah. That's very important. Otherwise, you'll cut the flow obliquely and get uh, wrong diameters of LVOT as well as the jet. So, if you can see here, and more this is a systolic flow, or in complete orange systolic flow. Between that is the uh, diastolic uh, compo diastolic phase, and the aliasing is the is the regurgitant jet, and uh, beyond that are the LVOT diameters. So. This is the diameter of Riga jet, and this is the diameter of this thing. Again, the timing will be important. You've got to see the uh, see a timing. Widest diameter in that and early, early diastole. We'll see an early diastole and the widest diameter here to make a measurement. Now, and all, see, jet area and jet width always to be seen only for applicable only for central jets. If the eccentric jet, multiple jets, uh, it's not a valid uh, uh, parameter to assess the well. Jet area, um, now mid surface short axis view. Get, uh, this is very important to get the view, 2D view, get a good view of the leaflets are co-opting or not co-opting, get, get to the tip of the leaflets, then put color Doppler, then by, then freeze it, then scroll it till you get a maximum, in diastole you get a maximum regurgitated regurgitated regurg jet, and by planimetry calculate area. Push the probe further inside, but less than one centimeter, 
can get, again do the same thing to calculate LVOT area, uh, LVOT area, or you can calculate LVOT area from the wrong axis. You take a ratio of that, and you can get a number. Less than five percent is uh, mild. Less than more than sixty, sixty-five percent severe. So again, you can come to whether it's mild or severe. This is what exactly you want to do uh, in this thing. Now coming to quantitative measures. If you come to the, that that chart which I showed you right at the beginning, mild. We come. We can. By these, so far we can get to what is mild AR, what is severe AR. Now, between if you are stuck up between grade two and grade grade three AR, then we want to see what what to apply. Is E R O A? These are the quantitative measure parameters. Uh, e R O A, effective regression load surface area, regression volume, and regression fraction. So, uh, regression volume less than thirty is mild, more than sixty is severe. Regression fraction again less than thirty is mild, more than 50, 60, 50 percent is severe. And E R O A. Less than 0.1 is supposed to be mild. Anything more than 0.3 is severe. And uh, yeah, how do we get that? Now just focus on this video here. So it is a deep transgastric view. Uh, I put a I put a Doppler, and and what you can see here, can you see here LAZ? So uh, uh, the aorta, mitral valve. This is a LV. Now LV is closer to a near field. This is like a long axis view exactly in the flip flip. Uh, in the opposite direction, aorta is right here in the far field. This is the aortic valve, and if you if you change it, you can see uh, you can see a aliasing happening here. Okay, this is, this is always to be timed with the opening and closure of the valves as well as the ECG to get the timing. And you can see the uh, you can you can see this envelope formed here. This is the orange color. This is the blue color, and between this is the yellow color. Is there any break of color? This is uh, in the first break of color is important. The first break of color. This you can see. There's a flow convergence from here. All the uh, blood is trying to getting accelerated to flow back through the EROA, effective regurgitant orifice area. So what happens? The narrow regurgitant area through which the regurgitant gets forced being forced back from the air, from the aorta to LV because of the pressure gradient. So as it gets forced to that, there's a flow acceleration that causes a breakage of color here, and that that is more or less of a particular shape. There's a shape of hemisphere. And uh, this is called a PISA formation, proximal isovelocity surface area. What we are, there are several hemispheres and several particles. So it's a shape of a hemisphere. Every point on the surface of the hemisphere will have the same velocity with which the, the blood particle is being uh, uh, approaching the regurgitated orifice area, uh, orifice to, to go back into the LV. So there are several hemisphere formed, and the surface of each hemisphere there'll be a, a points of same velocity. What we're concerned is, and this will be a, a shape of a hemisphere. This will be a shape of a hemisphere. So I'm coming to the next point. So this is the flow convergence. What I'm talking about. This is the this is the regurgitant orifice. Uh, the suppose there's the aortic side. There's the LV side. There's the aortic valve, and the part of the aortic valve is the regurgitant orifice. Now the flow, everything, the blood will flow, get accelerated to, uh, to flow back into the LV. They'll form aliasing, color breaking. They'll form a flow conversion, what you see. So every, there are several circles we form. We are, we are concerned about first aliasing velocity. First where is aliasing means change of color. What we have noted here, okay? First change of color. And we got to know this is a hemisphere. The shape is clear. And we have to know this point from here to the surface, from point of regurgitant orifice to the surface or any, any point on the hemisphere. We got to note a measurement as the radius of the hemisphere. Okay. Now, by, by if you get the radius of the hemisphere, you can calculate the area of, course, area of the hemisphere. The area of the hemisphere is pi r squared. Okay. This measurement of radius is very important because it gets squared. So, for accuracy, that measurement is important. So point identification that of those points of aliasing points are very important. Now this aliasing point, whether the radius will differ, whether it is less or more depends on the Nyquist limit or aliasing velocity what we get. It has to be around 40 to 60. Less than the 40, this radius will be broader for the same jet. If you give 60, 70, the radius will go tiny for the same jet. So keep it around 50 to 60 or 60, with, where you can get a good PISA envelope. Okay, freeze it, scroll it. And then calculate uh, then you calculate the radius. Yeah, area of this into the peak velocity, V1. V1 is the peak velocity with which the maximum velocity with which all the particles here on the surface of the pizza are going to flow back into the into the LV. That is V1. So if you measure 2 pi r square, 
the area into V1 will give you the Rigert volume. Okay, that will be, will give you that. And that's what we are going to look, uh, look up. And this is going to, there's a formula that we need to apply. Okay, so this is a pizza, this is a pizza radius. And if you can see the aortic valve in, in the one loop, one more point I want to measure is the, here is the flat line. This is the hemisphere here. Uh, two pi r square is the uh, area. Now, provided this line is flat, that if the line is flat, the angle is 180 degree. Okay, it's a straight line. So now if you come to this, in aortic, the angle will be more than 180. So two, up to 220 degrees is acceptable. If it's more than 220 degrees, then you have to apply another formula, which is two pi r square into alpha by 180. Alpha is this angle here. Alpha, alpha is this angle here. This will be obtuse angle, uh, more than 90 degree in case of AR. In case of mitral stenosis or uh, this thing that might be acute angle, so there's less of 180. So there, if it's not 180 of flat line, we have to have alpha which will be less than 180 upon uh, 180 for this thing. So rigorous flow that is flowing is 2 pi r square into the velocity. Okay, this is the formula. Velocity is the V1, what we have measured. V1 velocity is the aliasing velocity. Aliasing velocity, which is that, it is the Nyquist limit, what you have said. So, so you are getting that radius for that Nyquist limit. And if you apply in that formula, 2 pi r square into that velocity, you get a reverse flow, provided the angle is 180 degree. If the angle is not 180 degree, it's like this AR, you have to multiply by another factors, alpha by 180. Alpha is this angle. So it can be like 200 by 180 or 220 by 180. Up to studies have shown up to 220 by 180, this angle would not significantly impact or alter your uh, accuracy. So this is a point to be noted. Then what happens? This flow flows back. Uh, this will flow back to the to this this narrowest area. What is this area? Narrowest point is the EROA, effective regurgitant orifice area. And from area, the blood will flow back. Okay. And the blood that will flow uh, flow back. So first we have to calculate the EROA. So the calculus of EROA, effective regulatory orifice area, is, is given by uh, uh, this uh, uh, peak velocity, area of the pizza into the velocity divided by the maximum velocity of the air jet. So deep transgastric view, we have to get a deep transgastric view, get a put color, uh, color Doppler, adjust Nyquist image should be in 50 to 60. I scroll up and down to get a nice uh, pizza envelope in, in early diastole and calculate, identify which is the first aliasing point, calculate the radius, that radius we put as R, see the Nyquist limit what we are getting, that is the first velocity, V1 or uh, uh, aliasing velocity that comes, uh, that comes here. And below that, You get a pizza area here, and below we divide that by the peak velocity. So, the, apart from that, we have to get the continuous of Doppler and get this envelope and the AR, AR jet envelope by continuous of Doppler. On top of this point, peak point is a we have to note this point, which has to be more than four, definitely four, four point five to two into accuracy. And you measure the peak velocity, the peak velocity here is 525. You put in the formula, you get the EROA. So, this Method of PISA helps us in finding the EROA effective, effective regurgitant orifice area. Now, from that, you can put, get a value as 0.1 or 0.3. Less than 0.1 is mild, no other 0.3 is significant. Okay, now measurement is important, accuracy is important. Now, regurgitant volume, how do you find that? Now, this point, this area is the regurgitant orifice area. And the, what is effective area? I mean, effective because it is a dynamic thing that is changing the stored nitro. So effective regular orifice area, what happens? That into the flow. So by equation of continuity, area uh, into uh, BTI will give you the flow across that that particular point. So uh, you have the uh, uh, area of the ROA, uh, regular orifice, uh, and effective regular orifice area will give the area. And if you measure the VTI of this, I want to look flow back occurring. We already measured, uh, put this Doppler and got the AR jet reverse and reverse to flow. You put, uh, you put, you trace this pattern and you'll get a VTI. So EROA, what we've calculated just now from the first PISA equation, into this VTI will give you a regurgitant volume. Okay. Now you, uh, dip, now you've got a regurgitant volume. Now we will, we will go to the, uh, we have to find the uh, stroke volume across the aortic valve. 
by subsequent method and you get a rigorous fracture so rigorous value uh, eroa to vdi first of all we calculate the eroa effective rigorous orifice area by pisa method second we uh, you uh, you measure eroa into vdi you will get the rigorous volume so anything less than 30 is mild more than 60 is uh, significantly worse so again we have quantified two things now the third thing is rigorous fracture but to calculate rigorous fracture you have to compare it with the flow across the aortic valve so how much volume of regurgitation has occurred across the aortic valve uh, depending on percentage expressed uh, uh, on on the flow occurring from the lv to the aorta and the forward flow will give you the rigorous fracture so regurgitation flow divided by forward flow expressed as in percentage will give you the rigorous fracture now how, how do you find find out the uh, forward flow you you measure measure the lvd diameter in the middle of long axis view Deep transgastric view is the best view for alignment. You go there, put a pulse wave Doppler just beneath the aortic valve, and you get a VDI here. VDI, as you see here in the, third, the last image, trace it, you will get a VDI. So, area into VDI is flow. So, area, you assume the LVOT is to be assume, assumably a circle. You have got a diameter. Area of the circle is pi r square. So pi r square into the into is, is the area into the VTI across the what we have just measured in deep transgastric view will give you the flow. This flow is per cardiac per beat of the cardiac cycle. That is the stroke volume. The stroke volume of the LVOT. So this stroke volume, uh, this flow will be an excessive flow. This is an, uh, this is an encompass normal uh, stroke volume or inject, uh, stroke volume of the heart or normal injection. Volume of the heart plus the regression volume. So when you sub, uh, subtract, so when you get a forward flow across the aortic valve, and you have got a flow uh, regression regression volume. When you divide the two, you get a regression fraction. Okay. So basically, forward flow across the aortic valve and regression volume you can not need required to get a regression fraction. Now we have calculated three things: the PISA by EROA effective regression orifice area by the PISA calculation. Then you apply uh, that uh, the VTI formula, EROA to VTI will give you the uh, will give you the rigage volume. And then we have calculated the rigage volume. Then after you have for, for, uh, calculated the forward flow through the aortic valve, and then you calculate ratio to get rigage fraction. And this way you can quantify the uh, severity of AR in conditions where there is more, whether, when there is great to a great three AR, and you have to compare and compute. So there are different ways. Of now finding the regurgitated volume, so one of the methods what we did is by PISA. Other method is uh, is by VDI method. So as you, I have shared area at any particular point, if you can find that area and the VDI across that point, if uh, we can get the flow across that point. So area into VDI will give, go give the flow across that point. So we have just calculated LVOT area as I told you LVOT diameter here. Assume that is a circle pi r square. You get an area. You calculate a deep transgastric, then uh, you go to deep transgastric view, view, put a pulse wave Doppler, get the VTI in that particular uh, cardiac cycle, and you get a, a VTI. Area to VTI will give you flow. So that is a forward flow. That is a flow across the aortic band. Similarly, you can calculate a flow across the mitral band. Uh, mid serial four chamber view, you scroll the uh, 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 image, show you how the mitral annulus diameter, maximum diameter that is open. Uh, as as seen in the second image here, and below that, you, you put a pulse wave Doppler just between the mitral valve, yeah, get get the E and A waves, trace the E and A waves to get the VTI across the mitral valve. So that's probably calculate transmitral flow. So transmitral flow will give one number. Uh, trans aortic flow is the forward flow that will give uh, one number. And in AR, the trans aortic flow will be higher. So when you subtract that, we'll get a regurgitated volume. When you divide the two, you will get the regurgitated fraction. Okay. So again, you get the these two parameters by, by the VTI method. Now the same thing when the transmitral flow or the thing we can we can uh, we can get by the volumetric method. So these are the calculation of regurgitated volume and regurgitated fractions. We can apply the same thing to volumetric method. So in diastolic volume, in systolic volume, trace the volume and you can get the stroke volume. And this uh, this is the stroke volume that. That occurs across the aortic band. So uh, once sir, we have the rigorous volume, yeah, yeah. Uh, sorry to interrupt between sir. Uh, we have exceeded uh, yeah. thirty minutes, sir. So shall I? I'll just I'll just go faster now. Okay, okay. sir. Can we so, uh, wind up with fast, sir? Yes, we'll do that in five, okay, five, five minutes. Give me five minutes more. Okay, so you got a rigorous volume, 
and rigaj volume into vtr is a effective rigaj orifice area so rigaj volume from the earlier parameters you divide get the vtr here from and then and this another way of getting the eroa to quantify here now this is quantification done coming to aortic valve repair and is our air we have said part uh, type 1 and type 2 are amenable to repair but in the latest european guidelines class 1 in emergency indication says that every aortic valve should be offered a repair wherever possible at at best centers who do it and at high volume centers so bicuspid aortic valve can be repaired yes it can be repaired provided there are certain things that we know about it uh, this measurement is what we need to know are the annular size effective height effective height here are the two leaflets with coapt Uh, the distance which uh, the leaflets coapt is the coaptation height. The, from the annulus to the tip of the leaflet is the effective height, and the length from right from wall measured from the tip of the leaflet to the base of this is the geometric height. Important numbers are annulus 25. Effective height should be normally more than nine. Anything less than nine it indicates the frail or more excessive leaflet. After repair, the effective height should be more than nine. Geometric height uh, height should be in tricuspid valve 16 cut off. And bike speed valve 90 is cut off. Anything less than that, the repair is not possible uh, because there's a, a less amount of tissue uh, available. Coaptation height uh, should be at four to five millimeters. After repair, it has to be at least four millimeter, four millimeters to uh, to ensure adequacy of repair and durable repair. Uh, commissural height uh, orientation depends on the angle. Uh, one said, uh, what do you see? So if you like, uh, you have to find out whether unique speed or bike speed valve. Bike speed valve commonest is the RCC and LCC uh, fuse. And this orientation of the is horizontal, and if the if the, the second commonest presentation is uh, NCC and RCC fuse, then the orientation surgically is vertical. Uh, here the symmetric uh, coaptation angle, uh, commissural angle, I was talking about the bicuspid valve is the center where the uh, the coaptation takes place. From commissural, if you join the line to the coaptation, is the is the angle form that is called a coaptation angle uh, should be less than uh, between 160 to 180. It is called symmetrical. If it is less than 160, uh, 160 degrees, then the surgeon has to symmetrize the valve while uh, while repairing. By cuspid valve, if there is more of excessive movements, uh, uh, excessive movement and restriction, and there is adequate tissue left, that is the geometric height more than 19, it is possible to attempt a repair. These are just the numbers. The table says that these are these are table which uh, depending on mechanism, what kind of repair surgery, uh, surg repair. option is possible for those type of mechanism is given and uh, the post repair to assess the adequacy of repair so they should in post repair they should repair, it depends uh, adequacy will depend whether there is previous or trace here is fine but not more than that it also depends on type of jet central eccentric jet if the jet is eccentric is more dangerous only a trace uh, trace uh, only trace regurgitation jet is allowed not more than that If the regurgitation jet is because of excessive uh, motion with the effective height more than nine millimeters, then you can attempt thus the suspension again. Otherwise, if there is restricted the regurgitation central jet is because of restriction type three, then just go for replacement. Central jet a little more than trace previous to my uh, little uh, grade one is allowed, provided what you have to first see uh, is the quantified. You can you can uh, quantify. The effective EROA, effective regurgitation orifice area, got to be less than point uh, one, then it's fine. And the vena contractor less uh, less than two. Uh, if anything more than that, you need to uh, address it by either by repair or replacement. Now you need to calculate annual annual size more than twenty five for the aortic ring to shrink it and to tighten it. If if it doesn't uh, subside by that, then you go for valve replace, uh, replacement. Okay. Now uh, guidelines. Uh, we need to measure not only the aortic valve but also the other things like endoscopic diameter and ejection fraction by uh, by earlier guidelines by the 2020 guidelines. So EF is important. So now coming to I'll just take two minutes more. Uh, st uh, stage D symptomatic EF definitely what to operate. Stage C is the asymptomatic EF. We have to divide into uh, two C1 and C2. Asymptomatic EF with uh, LV ejection the uh, LV end systolic diameter less than 50. Uh, and if you, it's better if you index it to number less than 25. We probably can wait it. We we may not offer it uh, immediately. Also, we were at the same time. We only need a, you got to see the EF. Earlier guidelines, the cutoff was 50. Now the now the guidelines uh, earlier AHC guidelines go to 2014 was 50 cutoff, and the current ECTS guidelines 50 cutoff. But 2020. Dr. Hiran, can you just sum up quickly? We're already been crossed the time. Yes, yes, right away. Two minutes is fifty-five percent. If so, less than so. If the EF is good, 
and it's not dilated, it's C1, you do not operate. If it is EF is less than uh, 55% and is dilated with the end diastolic diameter more than 50 and index more than 25, you got to operate. Newer studies, however, focus on end diastolic volume, end systolic volumes and index it to more than 45. We probably need to operate now, but these are not in government guidelines. Also, the contractility status rather than ejection fraction, which is again calculated based on volumes, it will be better to uh, apply uh, tissues contractility parameters like S prime, tissue Doppler strain, or cardiac MRI to reach a conclusion. These are just the guidelines. It is guidelines which uh, EACTS guidelines which tells when to operate class four indication to a to b, and. Uh, Apart from that, uh, the evaluation of ER doesn't uh, uh, end with just adequate valve repair or valve uh, uh, replacement. But even if it's mitral valve surgery, and if uh, you are to, it's not that you go not to go to look at other valves. You can uh, post mitral valve surgery is quite often the aortic valve is hampered, and there's a new onset ER has been seen in multiple articles. So that has uh, that should not escape your review. Thank you. Sorry for exceeding time. I just tried, uh, went a little slow. Uh, That's fine. Thank you for the excellent talk. It was very good. Like, you know, starting from the anatomy. I can't hear. Um, sorry. Oh, can you hear me? Uh, I can't hear you. Hello? I'm unmuted only. Yeah. Can you I hear can. me now? I can. I yeah. can. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for such an excellent talk. It was really uh, very informative, starting from the anatomy, how to assess and how to do this. What are the limitations of the different, uh, you know, the way we assess the valve and all is very important. Uh, like, I basically, I didn't stop in between because I found that the way you've explained the effective orifice area, regurgitation volume, it was very good. Many people come with the uh, doubt that how to do that. So basically, that part, I really found it good so that I didn't inter interrupt you. But though we exited that time, but it was an excellent talk. And thank you for that. There is some question in the chat box. I'll just quickly go through all of you yes. have crossed the time. And just, uh, I, I just wanted to know if you can just a little bit highlight about the diastolic MR. It is very common in the uh, severe AR. And many people, they come to the diastolic MR, how to, like, what is well, basically it? Just quickly, if you can say that. And I'm just coming with the questions. Okay, so even even when you are concomitant in other valves, so if there's an MS or MR, then the quantification or, uh, of AR, we have to look into that also. So uh, the AR jet pressure half time, what we see, uh, because it is dependent on pressure gradient pressure difference, it is the aorta and LVDP. Then in case of MR, concomitant mitral regurgitation, the LVDP will be already higher side, and the pressure half time will be falsely reduced, so it might overestimate the lesion. Similar with MS, it might underestimate lesion. So we had to quantify uh, uh, this, uh, uh, whether we need to operate or not, take into consideration the mitral disease as well, or anything that causes increased LVDP, maybe the concentric LVH, etc. Uh, any In these guidelines, if you have AS and AR together, then even if you quantify it to be moderate AR, you know, it's severe AR, moderate AS and AR, then you can go for surgery. If you are doing concomitant mitral surgery, even if you get this uh, quantified to the to grade two or grade three, also you can go for surgery. That to be. One question: Do we see triphasic flow in smaller vessels and biphasic flow in larger vessels normally? Uh, sorry. Uh, is, uh, there's a question: Do we see triphasic flow in smaller vessel and the biphasic flow in larger vessel normally? So, so, so the central vessel, uh, central vessels aorta and uh, so will have a biphasic flow. They are more compliant. As you go distally, even a supplement artery, you will have a, a triphasic flow pattern. So, uh, compliant central vessel should be only biphasic. Uh, I, I don't I'm sorry, I can't hear. Yeah, how many of this qu uh, quantification you do practically? We basically wanted to know that. Basically, normally, how many is feasible to do when you assess the aortic valve? So, what they have said is uh, most of the times you want to see qualitative and semi quantitative, and you get a fair idea whether it's mild or severe. If it's totally mild or totally severe, then you are almost set. If it is, it's a question when it is in between and uh, the LV is not too dilated, uh, uh, the ejection, uh, you are not getting a mean uh, contract, uh, and we are getting more than one value which are contradicting or which not uh, more than two, three criteria. Pointing towards a mild AR, it is mild AR. More than two, three criteria are going to in a favor of a severe AR, is a severe, and you've got an answer. It's that in between thing, then you've got to go for the regurg volumes. And regurg volumes, you can uh, go by volumetric methods uh, or by the VTI methods, calculate the regurg volume, and you can regurg fraction. Thank you. 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 Thank
it's important for the visa and ERA to get a have a more central data because the calculation of VTI will be important there. If the data is eccentric and you cannot get a good VTI, then you cannot calculate the regard volume by the PISA method. Hence, we have to, we'll have to do it by the volumetric method or the stroke volume method. Putting two, three methods together, you can arrive, you can quantify that uh, yeah, into milder or senior category. So another question was that uh, should we calculate annular size and the LV diameter according to the uh, body surface area or absolute cutoff value? There's one more question. Right? Yeah, so they have the uh, the, uh, LV, uh, the diameters have to be indexed. Uh, uh, the guidelines say that diameters have to be uh, indexed as per body surface area uh, uh, to get a better as you say uh, we said uh, uh, in LV and swing diameters. Uh, uh, more than six, uh, more than uh, and systolic diameters, more than endoscopic diameter, and index values you can get 25 are more indicative to take a uh, decision making. Another thing was like jet weight and LVOT weights in MO to be done in early or late phase of gastro. Uh, you have to, uh, you have to sir, uh, get the maximum width and it should be in early gastro. Basically, the J2, the LVOT M mode, I think you have to see where the width area is the maximum. Like, you know, it is since irregular yeah. jet shape. It can yeah, be a different, scroll it different up shape. And, yeah. yeah, so that's part of, so you have to see where the width is the maximum. So then on the other is it underestimated or overestimated. So if you are doing long axis view, you, uh, you freeze it, scroll it, get the maximum thing just closer to the aortic valve and take the measurements. In M mode, you will get a continuous display which take the maximum width throughout the test hole. And prefer uh, an early part of that. So I think we have covered most of the questions. Any other question? Um, uh, sir has told he has already left for Monibal Hospital. So I just would like to conclude the session. Thanks yeah. a lot, Dr. Niranjan. Thank you, yeah. everyone. So I'm just concluding here. Thanks a lot. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I apologize for uh, exceeding the time limit, but I was told to go a little slow, so I had, uh, went a little slow, and that uh, situation got a little. Uh, yeah, the topic was like that; it is very extensive, so you have taken some time. Yeah. <laughs> there are more questions or? Any more question is not there. I think our chat box everything has cleared in. Any more question is there? They can uh, directly ask us question whether just to put the audio on. Thank you. So Rajiv, shall we leave? Yes, ma'am. Uh, we can conclude the session, ma'am. Pardon me? We can conclude the session, ma'am. Yeah, yeah. Is it so that's the thing. We are just concluding here. Thank you, okay. Dr. Niranjan, to be thank with you. us. And thank all the participants to be with us. And it's an excellent talk. All have learned a lot from you. Thank you. Thank you.